talked about the, the instigation of this whole thing by the Dietetics Association, but it was what more than three years ago now that you were trying to understand um, why it was that, that he was being attacked like this. And so you started doing a bunch of research and we t I talked with him and went in an interview with him uh, um, a little bit about what you got, what you discovered. But it seems that uh, over that three-year period that you really did open a Pandora's box there. So um, we don't have a whole lot of time here, but maybe give us a, like in a nutshell what it's about and then we can tell people where they can go and uh, find out more information about it if, they can, if they're interested. I'd say right at the very beginning it was just don't shoot the messenger. Mm -hmm. you know, why are these people picking on Gary because he's talking about the science? And as time went on with the low carb down under and, and the different people I was hearing and meeting online, I was thinking everyone's talking about the science and there's so much science to back low carb healthy fat, especially for diabetes, type 2 diabetes. And I couldn't work out why it was being, why high carb and low fat was being so hugely defended. And so I, I didn't head into it doing research. I was just trying to find out it for, at the beginning why Gary wasn't being listened to. And the expert witness in Gary's case, because he was a nutrition expert and, and he didn't answer my emails. And <laughs> did <laughs> I wrote him really nice emails just saying, can you just have a chat to my husband and just consider this before you put down you know, what you're going to say? And then I started to research him, I guess, to find out, I thought, well, maybe he's involved with the sugar industry. You know, why would someone be so anti-low carb and what Gary's talking about, well, sugar to start with, why would he be so anti that? And the more I looked into what he was doing and, and where he was involved, and I found that he worked for Sanitarium Health Food Company in Australia, which is owned by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And they provide resources for doctors, they provide health lectures, you know, they're, they're considered a very big health brand in Australia. Okay. Kids grow up eating wheat bix, you know, all those sort of things. So I was thinking, well, that's really interesting. So it might be the food industry. And uh, I, I just started looking at different influences. I started looking at research that, that was anti-low carb and anti-saturated fat. And we really thought it was the low carb because Australia produces sugar, it produces wheat, and so we we're really threatening industry as well. You know, what were the what were the influences behind this? And of course, pharmaceutical industry, you start to hear more and more about that. With type 2 diabetes, you know, it's a it's a chronic progressive disease, that's what we've been told by mm -hmm. Diabetes Australia. And they're funded by the pharmaceutical industry. Of so They've been putting that, but Gary's been proving that diabetes doesn't have to be a chronic progressive disease. So, okay, so it's the pharmaceutical industries that are protecting their business. Mm -hmm. It's the food industry protecting their business. And then I started to realise the influences of vegan vegetarianism. And there's no doubt there's a lot of lobbying and, and that area is really growing. And there's a lot of fake meat analogues now and the soy industry and, you know, really that vegan movement is getting bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. But it, I kept coming back to the fact that this um, professor was involved with sanitarium and then I was finding that he was involved in Seventh-day Adventist groups in other parts of the world or he was aligned with someone who was Seventh-day Adventism, also very much aligned with the food industry. So uh, I was getting confused by all the mixed messages but I just started to uncover quite a lot of information about the Seventh-day Adventist Church and their health reform message and the fact that they started the Dietetics Association of America um, in 1917 and there's a lot of people have written about different influences there but they're very anti-meat and anti-saturated fat and I hadn't realised how important vegetarianism and veganism was to the Seventh-day Adventist Church and I guess over the last three years, what I've come to realise is the people who are really, or the groups, the movement that's anti-low-carb, healthy fats, which is what we tend to call it rather than high fat, mm -hmm. um, it just it, it's an easier message for a lot of the people that we work with to understand. Right. Um, the people that are against it really seem to be um, anyone who's anti-saturated fat, anyone who's anti-meat, and anyone who's protecting the food industry and protecting the pharmaceutical industry. And I think those four are meeting in the perfect storm right now 
to promote their messages and they want us silenced. Mm. They want what we're talking about silenced because it's, it's, it's threatening their industries. So yeah. the belief system that um, we should be eating uh, the Garden of Eden diet right. has come from the Seventh-day Adventists, so nuts, seeds, fruit, vegetables. Um, then you've got the vegans who really don't want anything to do with meat. They've got a lot of lobbying, they've got a lot of money. So by them supporting the research that Seventh-day Adventists are doing, because medical evangelism is the right arm of the church, so they've really invested a lot into doing research and different things to prove Ellen G. White's visions from the 1800s. Massive vegetarian, vegan movement, even going into Silicon Valley now, because they're making all the fake meats, and there's a lot of people who are thinking about climate and thinking about the earth, you know, mm. saving the planet. So they're pitching into that way, and then you say you've got the food industry, the making the fake foods, processed food industry. It's much cheaper to add sugar and and unsaturated oils and have healthier foods, and then the pharmaceutical. And mm. it's it's just so it's not a conspiracy. It's it's just that they've all converged, and it's just the perfect time for them all right. to really be growing. I think. Yeah, and what I, what I find, or I've learned this weekend that's so fascinating is this other um, force that's that the whole religious side of things that mm. we'd never considered before. We kind of were aware of all the other factors coming together in the perfect storm, but now there's another, another one which is um, a religious one. And the Seventh day Adventist Church are part of the temperance movement, so they were anti anti-tobacco, anti-alcohol, but they were anti-meat because they thought it caused aggression. So, and there were other, the Bible Christian groups as well, there are other religious groups that also believe this, right. that meat caused aggression. And so they really, really have been pushing that side for a long time and it's... Yeah, and it's from, from what I'm hearing from you guys is, and all the research that you've done is how much influence they have over um, medical education and the, the f and the hope, yes, and um, and from back, you know, Gary brought it up and saying like we all, me, I'm a big one. I'm always blaming Ansel Keys and the McGovern Commission, mm -hmm. but this started like in the eight, late 1800s and 1917. Yeah, you know, um, and and they've been they created these organisations in the first place. That they started the cereal industry, right? They and they started the cereal industry because Kellogg's and and Ellen G. White could see 101 cereal companies started in Battle Creek, Michigan, where the Seventh Day Adventist Church was based right. in the 1860s and through to the 1900s, early 1900s. And they started the cereal industry because they wanted people to eat bland food and it would stop them eating meat. Right. Um, and then Ellen G. White could see the success of the cereal companies and all the different things that they were doing. So she came to Australia. And she came to Australia in 1890 and stayed for 11 years. She set up Sanitarium, the food industry owned by the church in Australia. She set up college, schools, um, church obviously, and she set up printing a printing press and all these things in that time that she was here. And so the influence of, on health is massive in Australia and we just had no idea. Right. No idea. And it's like so her writings and Kellogg wrote a bunch of books as well, right? And yes. all that all the basis of the She's one of the most prolific the dietary guidelines in the world. Have. That's unbelievable. I I have to go back and uh, next time I'm I'm talking up on a stage I'm gonna have to give Ansel Keys and McGovern a bit of a, a bit of a break here because Gary was Gary was saying that they actually they were influenced by influenced. You know, what, what came before them. Yeah, well, and, and, you know, I think Frederick Steer and Mark Hegstead, they were, they were funded by the sugar industry, that the information's all just come out at the end of last year. And so they were directly involved in the McGovern report. So a, again, there's influences from so many places that all happened, but the 70s also became the time of the hippies. Right. So vegan food was cool. So it, it all came together in that time. It was yeah. like this little mini explosion of, this is the perfect time for all of these places to align. And so, yeah, it's, it, it's really fascinating, and I think that's why I'm, I'm it's, it's, it's not a, an anger or confusion, it's, it's just like, this is so fascinating, all these things are happening, but it goes back way before. Right. Everyone was stuck on the 70s, but you've got to ask why. 
Yeah. And it goes further back. But this is, I mean, I, we've been talking all weekend about this and it's going to continue, I'm sure. Um, but there's so much information that, that you, you have uncovered and you were telling me that you're going to um, put it all in a blog and, yeah. and reference it and everything like that so that people yeah. who want to learn about this can, can have a really good place to start. Yeah. So um, at least for the, for the benefit of the YouTube uh, viewers, yes. if you could just explain where they could go and find that. And then when I do a blog on it, I'll, I'll reference that as well. Okay, well because Gary had started his own website, um, nofructose.com, um, when I had to take it over, I thought, I just cannot do a website for him, no, for, I mean, no offence, but his website's a very, very busy website. He's put <laughs> absolutely everything you can possibly find, and he's, he understands his um, organisation, but it was just overwhelming for me. I didn't even know where to start. Okay. So I've taken it over, but I haven't. I've done his um, Facebook page, and I've kept that going, and I, and I post nearly every day, and, and interact with everybody, and I think and that it's changed a little bit. How, so, how Belinda Fetke, no fructose. Belinda Fetke, no fructose. Instead of Gary Fetke, no fructose, it's okay. now Belinda Fetke, no fructose. So I've been running that page, but when we were going to come out, before Gary did his CrossFit, the talk at CrossFit Games last year, mm -hmm. We decided it wasn't fair to come out and do an hour talk on the influences of the dietary guidelines from a religious perspective, which hadn't really been considered in the low carb space so much at this point in time, without uh, some sort of reference to be able to have. And because I'm trying to clear Gary's name, that's my major goal. Um, I call the website isupportgary.com, and in that, I'm sharing Gary's stories, but I'm also trying to share the influences on the dietary guidelines. I did my own talk in October last year at Lake Carb yeah, Canada, that's awesome. and it was the evolution of the plant-based dietary guidelines, you know, right. because that's what we keep hearing, plant-based, you know, plant-based whole grain, cereal, soy, I realised now I know why, um, and lean meat's just tucked in, trying not to talk about it at all. Right. So working out all of this, I decided to create the website and I'm adding to it all the time and I'm really keen to do a timeline to show people the influences going right back. You know, where did vegetarianism start? Who were the major influences? When did it become a Western cereal-based grain right. soy? When did, when did it change? Um, and so, it, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah. And I'm, and Your I'm research is ongoing, right? I mean, no, you're just learning more and more every so day. Much. So, yeah, so people, if they wanted to learn about that, I support Gary.com. And uh, um, they can start. They can start learning about it there, and just follow you down your rabbit hole. <laughs> follow me down the awesome. rabbit hole. And yes, I'll, I'll look forward to sharing the blog with you when, yeah, I, when I get totally. it up. And thanks so much for right. interviewing me and, and letting this message go out because I think I always hashtag you know stronger together. We need to work with people to get this message out. Right. And for healthcare professionals who are starting to talk about this and are under regulation, we if we're louder and we're supported by people like you and Low Carb USA, we're much safer as well talking in this space. So, awesome. well, thanks so much. It's been awesome. All right, thank All right, you. Thanks.